So we're going to go back to Clara Long to talk about the new report uh, that she has just come out with. Clara Long is a senior researcher at Human Rights Watch. Code Red, that's the name of this explosive Human Rights Watch report released this week that exposes dangerously substandard medical care in ICE detention facilities around the country. More people died in immigration detention in 2017 than any year since 2009. Physicians reviewed 15 deaths in immigration detention from December 2015 to April 2017, determining that substandard medical care contributed or led to eight of the 15 deaths. Here's the video Human Rights Watch produced to accompany the report. You hear first from the report's author, our guest Clara Long, then Dr. Robert Cohen, who investigated ICE medical reports of deaths in custody. This is Clara Long. Moises Tino Lopez had first one and then a second seizure in immigration detention. Our medical experts said that the first seizure and certainly the second seizure should have prompted a high level of care and concern. That did not happen. And he ultimately had a third seizure that was fatal. My task here was to, was to say, was this death preventable? And in the majority of the cases that I reviewed, uh, the deaths were preventable if the medical and correctional staff had done the right thing. In the seven-year period from 2010 to 2017, 74 people have died in immigration detention. In 52 of those cases, we've been able to examine some government records. In 23 cases, poor medical care contributed to the fatal outcome. The major problems were uh, inadequate staffing, not having doctors on site as often as you might need to, not having medications available, delays in diagnosis, and delays in access to emergency care. Back in 1994, 6,800 people were locked up on any given night in immigration detention. But that number has rapidly increased over the last two administrations. And right now, over 40,000 people a night are in detention centers around the country. The Trump administration has asked for funding to increase that number to 52,000 people a night by the end of 2019. They hope to use the system to deport people rapidly and without due process. Unfortunately, even short periods of time inside detention centers uh, with dangerous conditions, like poor medical care, can lead to very serious consequences. That's Clara Long, senior researcher at Human Rights Watch, the author of the report Code Red, The Fatal Consequences of Dangerously Substandard Medical Care and Immigration Detention. Clara, continue with what you're saying in this report. It is terrifying. It's terrifying. ICE, uh, what we found is that ICE, the agency that's de detaining, uh, as we said, now 40,000 uh, people a day and, and wants to expand, uh, cannot provide adequately for the safety of the people that it holds. Uh, these deaths are really the tip of the iceberg. And one thing I want to emphasize is that although our medical experts found that eight of the 15 deaths, these recent deaths that we were able to review, uh, were ones in which poor care contributed or led to the fatal outcome, in 14 of the 15 cases, there was there was clear evidence that uh, ICE facilities and medical care, care professionals were involved in dangerous practices that could have caused death in like. another case. Like, um, in many of these facilities, you have licensed practical nurses, people who have had about 18 months of training post high school, who are charged with making uh, medical diagnoses and managing very serious conditions. In one of the cases we reviewed, a man had new onset congestive heart failure. He wasn't able to see a doctor. Instead, he saw one of these licensed practical nurses who told him to drink more water, something we hear a lot from people who are detained as the, as the panacea. Um, in the case of congestive heart failure, that can actually make it worse and, and, and lead to a, to a fatal outcome, because your heart is not able to clear the, the fluid out of your body. Um, in other cases, we, um, you know, we saw you know, this botched emergency response, this very, these indifferent attitudes. Um, for example, Mr. Jose Azurdia, who died in Adelanto detention in facility in, in, um, in 2015, began to have the symptoms of a heart attack. You know, he had chest pain. He was sweating. Uh, a nurse actually entered the unit uh, for another reason. And, and was told, this man is sick, he's vomiting. She said, I don't want to see him because I don't want to get sick. 
And that started this two-hour delay to, for him to get to the hospital to get care for this heart attack. Our medical expert said, you know, when you're having a heart attack, this is probably obvious to everyone, time is muscle. So the more time that you don't get treatment for a heart attack, the more of your heart muscle dies and the harder it is to survive. Tell us more of these stories of the people who you found that, whose deaths were directly a result of the lack of medical care or the horrible medical care within the ICE detention facilities. Sure. Um, we mentioned in, in, the, um, in the video a, a man named Moises Tino Lopez. He was 23 years old, has a family, children, um, and, he, and he had a, a seizure in, uh, in Hall County Jail in Nebraska. Uh, the staff there just took his, his mattress and put it on the floor. That's all they did. They didn't, they didn't send him to a doctor. Uh, he ended up seeing a nurse but, and was prescribed seizure medication. But uh, there seemed to be some sort of there was a, there was a language um, uh, barrier. There was uh, sort of unexplained reasons why nurses didn't follow up on him not taking that seizure medication. He had another seizure. They again did not respond. Um, instead, putting him in an isolation cell where he seized again and died. Um, you know, these are people who are beloved members of communities uh, who are swept up into this dangerous system. And if you allow me, I mean, one of the things that's really worrying about this executive order and the moment we're in now in terms of the end of so-called, you know, mass family separation is that we're starting a family incarceration crisis and um, that we're putting more and more vulnerable people into this dangerous system. Already, the Trump administration has begun um, doing the generalized detention of pregnant women, uh, detaining people who are seeking asylum, even people who are coming in at ports of entry, trying to do everything right, keeping them throughout, through in prolonged periods throughout the pendency of their cases. The exposure is just growing and growing to this dangerous system, which makes this, this, uh, these findings so very worrying, because more and more people will be exposed to conditions that very predictably, in the words of our independent experts, cause death. And how long, on average, were these people being held in ICE detention? And explain the facilities. I think very few people understand all the different layers of prisons, detention centers, tent cities. You have mothers who have been brought up from the border, separated from their children. They're in a uh, Washington state prison. Um, yet these are not criminals. Yeah, it, it's a patchwork of facilities that are flung out across the United States, oftentimes in uh, very isolated areas where, you know, it's difficult for, for medical professionals or lawyers to, to reach. Um, the, as you say, they, they, involve, they include uh, county jails. Uh, a, a majority of them are uh, private prison companies uh, that have been stood up, sometimes explicitly for immigration detention. And in recent weeks, we've seen the Trump administration put about 1,500 people now into federal prison, uh, which raises a whole other set of concerns about high, how ICE is um, <clears throat> supposed to uh, ensure oversight of those conditions and of, of access to those people uh, when it can't even keep its own house in order. Um, you know, the, you asked about the range of detention. You know, it's interesting because we, we see uh, these dangerous conditions affect people at, at many different amounts of time in detention. I mean, one case that comes to mind is a man named um, Igor Zyasen. He was a Russian national who crossed into the, into the U.S. in 2016. And um, he carried with him in his backpack, he came with his wife, uh, he carried with him his heart medication and um, some information about his condition. But they put that and locked it up in his property, never examined it, and didn't allow him to access it. Um, when he was detained at the San Luis Regional Detention Center, he began to have, again, chest pain. Uh, a nurse, uh, a licensed practical nurse, uh, said, OK, well, I'll give you some nitroglycerin. Um, that, you know, chest pain in someone with a heart trouble should prompt nitroglycerin and a call to 911. She did not do that. Instead, some correctional officers there said, actually, I don't know if we want to have this really sick guy in our facility. So they decided to sort of pack him up and actually put him in a van and drive him four hours to another facility where they thought there was better medical care. Um, there he did get an EKG. Uh, there, he did see a doctor. But, uh, but even before that EKG was, was read, he had, um, had another heart attack and, and died in his cell there. Wow. Well, on Thursday, dozens of parents and kids protested at the offices of the Thomas R. of Thomas R. Decker, the new New York field office director for ICE enforcement and removal operations, in protest of the Trump administration's zero tolerance policy. This is some of the voices of the kids and parents there.
My name is Isabel Valera, and I'm here because I think that it's unfair that children are getting locked up for no reason when they're not even breaking the law. I think this is clearly a moment when many, many people have gotten outraged about the family separation issue. It's so emotional. I think the big question is now, how can we take that wave of outrage and redirect it or, or continue to focus it on U.S. policy around immigration more broadly? I'm Jamara Rose Davis, and I'm eight years old. Young immigrants should be free to stay with their parents, and their parents should be free to stay with their kids. No kid should be in jail. My name is Mirna Haida. Last week I was here for my own immigration interview in the same very building, um, and it's really, uh, I'm feeling intensely to be here again, vulnerable, where my application is not really fully approved yet, uh, but I'm with my American children, and for, in some weird way they are giving me strength to be here so we can fight for other children um, and other families. Incarceration in general sucks, and it usually impacts only people of color or people who don't have citizenship or people who are poor. Um, and uh, incarceration. My name is Jojo Gelman, and I'm 10 years old. I'm protesting that people and their kids are getting sent to jail because they're from a different country. My sign says, get your tiny hands off our children. And the tiny hands person means Donald, Donald Trump. Those are the voices of children and parents protesting outside the ICE offices in New York and inside as well. Special thanks to Democracy Now!'s Nat Needham. Um, it is very important to hear these voices, because these are the voices that are changing national policy in this country, as the uh, corporate media interviews the politicians and, you know, they're critical in making decisions. It is the protests around this country this week, the enormous outcry that has clearly forced President Trump into retreat. Now, I want to turn to Virginia Governor Ralph Northam, who's called for an investigation after the Associated Press expose about conditions at the Shenandoah Valley Juvenile Center. The AP reported immigrant children as young as 14 housed um, say they were beaten while handcuffed and locked up for long periods in solitary confinement, left nude and shivering in concrete cells. Clara Long, can you respond to this? Right. This is a detention center that's within the Office of Refugee Resettlement Network. So it's a detention center that's holding unaccompanied children, including children who would be separated. It's it's a it's called a staff secure facility. So that means it looks a lot like juvenile detention, um, juvenile criminal justice detention in the United States. Um, you know what? You know you were saying the power of these protests. Uh, I, I have to tell you, I mean, the allegations in that complaint have been a, a matter of public record for a, over a year now, um, and something that we've been following and been very concerned about. But this is the moment in which uh, people can hear them, uh, and and that's uh, that's hopeful to me. Uh, the, the and the allegations are, are terrible. I, I feel very particularly impacted by them because I actually met a, a child in Mexico who had who had been in that center independent of it, before I knew of this lawsuit, and told me exactly the same thing, that he had seen children uh, shackled and beaten and tased while he was detained there. And what about this news that we were reporting on yesterday about children in detention facilities being injected with drugs and being forced to take drugs? Right. I mean, that, again, you know, we've recently—that uh, is sort of of a piece of these serious concerns particularly with the the staff, the, the, what they call staff secure uh, portions of the OR facilities, uh, in which um, there doesn't seem to be adequate oversight, uh, accountability, investigations of conditions. I mean, the most important thing to recognize here also is that uh, for the, you know, under human rights law, um, children should not be detained for immigration reasons. Uh, it's simply too harmful uh, for the countervailing governmental interest. The story about um, Shiloh Treatment Center in southern Houston, right. uh, where kids held there forcibly injected with medications that make them dizzy, listless, obese, even incapacitated. Yeah. Uh, this, according to reports by Reveal. Meanwhile, according to another Reveal investigation, taxpayers have paid more than one and a half billion dollars over the past four years to companies operating immigration youth facilities, despite facing accusations of rampant sexual and physical abuse. Right. Correct. You what know, kind of control is there over this 
immigration industrial complex, the private corporations that are running these facilities. Some are also nonprofits. Yeah, I mean, this is why it's so incredibly important that people who are outraged by the family separation do not look away now, uh, because there needs to be uh, increased public pressure, increased attention to exactly that question, Amy. What kind of control is there over these facilities? Because no one, no one seems to be minding the store in terms of uh, making sure that people's rights are respected. Clara Long, I want to thank you for being with us, senior researcher at Human Rights Watch, author of the report that will link to Code Red, The Fatal Consequences of Dangerously Substandard Medical Care and Immigration Detention. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, the harrowing story of an Eritrean man who was held in detention in Broward County, Florida. Terrified if he was returned to Eritrea, he would be killed. The U.S. deported him. On his way back at Cairo Airport, he took his own life. Stay with us.